That would be cool. So last time we did first total difference equations where we had y2 equals wt plus v1 wt minus 1 plus v1 squared wt minus 2 plus v1 cubed wt minus 3 plus dot 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 kept on going. Correct. And W sub T here are noise of some sort. As I mentioned, your book starts by saying, okay, we'll just treat them as scalars. But in practice, those are all quantum variables. Um, and I gave that example. So, what if you are today as a person? It's just a linear combination of random things that happened in your life in the past multiplied by those values. Right. Now, this simply says, you know, only one order, in other words, one difference. Um, so, all the way up to there would be significant. Everything past that would not be significant. But going back to my philosophical logic example, that's not reasonable because we may not regret just on, you know, past two, one day but maybe at least 20 days, right? So, and some people obsess over the past significantly, for them it will be 365, or you know, 800. Yes. A different for anxiety. Right, so, first of the difference, will go theoretically all the way up to that point. And also V1 would, uh, converge under a condition. So I can rewrite this as uh, 1 over 1 minus P1 multiplied by WT. That's what we did last time. Yes? Yeah. And then from here, I went to write it as a sum which would be quite obvious, um, i equals zero to infinity, v1 raised i multiplied by wt. So when I plug in zero, I would end up getting one, one times wt is wt, when i is one, v1 times wt, oh, the i very important. Uh, phi one raise one is phi one, and i is one. I get one. When i is two, phi one squared. I is two. W t minus two, and so forth. W t minus i is of course a constant. It's not a constant. We'll get to that. Is. But just this part right here, it is a infinite sum of a geometric series. I take that back. Uh, those eyes come from the lab operator, so it is simply WT. Remember, we had V1 multiplied by L, which is the lag operator. So the lag as we apply, would result in uh, t minus i and so forth. And that would simply be a geometric series, and we would require v1l raise i as some constant a. The thing about geometric series is that we want v1l to be bounded by one. In other words, if it exceeds one, the series will not be converted. What do we mean by converted? As you go over and over, um, go on and on, on and on and on, all the way up to infinity, things have to become zero. Do you agree? Yeah. So if it, at 256, you are still at a very high value for 
uh, phi or phi raised to 136, then you're reversing way too much to be great. So it has to decrease. And the only way that would happen is if this condition is satisfied. Good so far. Now, keep in mind, L is an operator. And operators, if it's kind of is silly to say an operator must satisfy the condition. So what we do is we rather use a variable um, to come up with a solution. So going back to that expression, We will rewrite that L as some letter. Your book uses Z. Uh, that is typical. So we're going to multiply by one minus V one L on both sides. So I end up getting one minus V one L times W uh, Y T is equal to W T. So we're going to replace that um, L by T, Z. Is it more, is that more just a thing that's a change? It's more of a theoretical thing. Uh, in the sense, you can't say, I have an operator. And I'm going to come up with a condition for that operator. In other words, think of it this way integral sign, right? Integral is an operator. So this is an operator that acts on, say, f of x dx. I can't say, oh, that integral has to converge to zero. That doesn't make any sense. Likewise, I have derivative of f of x. This simply means d over dx is an operator. You can't say the operator which has to satisfy the condition, right? But if I arbitrarily make that a variable, say z, then I can impose a condition on z. Does that make sense? Now, this is what we call a characteristic polynomial. And combining chapter one and chapter two together, because the book is going in different directions. Um, so you have a lot of reading to do, but if we do it this way, it'll minimize and you can just stick to the notes and understand that this is better. So what we want is that this must equal to zero. So it will become zero if that is zero. Do we agree? So we'll set one minus v one. Z is equal to zero. One is equal to v one times z. And that will give us a solution. And that solution Z is simply one over V1. There is something you've got to note here. Our condition for V1 
the absolute value has to be less than absolute value of phi one has to be less than one, and phi one cannot equal zero. Let's say that makes sense. Well, there to the standpoint, if P1 is zero, then I'll have divided by zero P. Right? Can't be zero. And from a practical standpoint, what is our understanding? If P1 is zero, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone, everything is gone. And we end up saying, whatever you are today is just noise, you mean nothing. Okay, we call it people fake, right? It's completely random. If this is noise, then you're noise too. I'm telling you, there is no meaning to you, you're just noisy. So, in other words, like, does that make sense? Yeah, it's really noisy, because maybe you just scream all the time. Well, if you think about it, but then a living one baby is definitely noise. Yes. Right? That's a, that's a good observation, Alex. If it's a newly born baby today, is going to be based on today, it's just noise. Um, it has no experience at all. Um, but over, over the years, it's going to gain experience. Um, so P1 cannot be zero. So when you become an adult, you can't say, oh, P1 is zero, which means every waking day, you're just rather noise. And now I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> so P1 is not equal to zero. P1 is bounded by one. And that would simply imply here the absolute value of Z. Let's say if you remember your algebra, if V1 is bounded by 1, in a sense, V1 is always a decimal value between 0 and 1. And what is the condition for the absolute value of Z? Greater than 1. It has to be greater than 1. Later on, when we get to chapter 3 and we start discussing autoregressive models and uh, moving average models, we will see that if I'm looking at the characteristic polynomial, the condition that we impose is this. So we will simply say that we have introduced the concept of the unit circle in complex plane. We want everything to be outside the unit circle. But if I'm looking at things on the left hand side, we want everything to be inside the unit circle. And then there is the concept of the unit root, which simply means you lie exactly on the unit circle. Um, there are some consequences for each of those conditions, and we will get into detail as we go along. Can you repeat those or are you just repeat them and repeat it later? So these conditions are important for the processes that we talk about later. But the key difference is if you are looking at the characteristic polynomial from the perspective of the characteristic polynomial, we want the value of z, the root of z, to lie outside the unit circle, greater than one. But if we are looking at it on this side, we want the coefficient phi one to lie inside the unit circle. In other words, it has to be decimal values. Um, and there are cases where the roots would end up lying exactly at one. And those are called unit roots, and I think we cover that next one. Um, so the concluding remark here is it matters as to what you're looking at. So, are you looking at from the perspective of the characteristic polynomial, or are you looking at from this side using that? Good. I will do it. Okay. I'll do a simple example. And I'll erase this. What kind of cats do you have, by the way? Oh. Or you're erasing what kind of cats do you have? You've seen them in my virtual yeah, uh, meetings. 
last semester, right? Yeah, yeah but I think we see one. Maybe I should see there. Virtues are not to see there. The one you see, the one you have seen during our appointments, um, is the oldest one and he is the most social one. Um, the other one is social also, but he just doesn't like my meetings. Yeah. You should bring him the class back right there. No, it's against college policy. He's yeah, already very well dressed up. Call your favorite cat. Be here guys at two in the morning, you just say go away. Oh, I shut the door and make him go away. Is that why I are not here? Uh, yeah, no. That's how you like to keep. I'm not right, here. Like, like, well, I do that too, but maybe it's just a variable. I, maybe you write it down. I see. <laughs> it's a <laughs> nine. I mean, great that I write it four is going to be different from almost everybody else. So. I, I understand. So I just specified it as noise, but I'm not calling it today white noise. Um, in other words, I'm not saying it's normally disputed. And let's see what happens. First, we've got to realize that phi1 is within 0 and 1. So things should work nicely. 
So means equal to point one. And so it's the same thing, right? If I say that to be the condition, that holds true also. You mean you want me to put equal to me? I mean then it makes it true. Yeah. I see what you say. I thought what you meant to say V1 is just equal to point one. So that satisfies the condition so we can go well if V1 is equal to point one that's what you wrote. Come again. Is V1 just equal to point one? That's what you wrote. So I'm just writing it as a condition. Oh, right. What is our condition? We require the condition to be the absolute value of you know V1 to be less than or be less than um, one. So if I wrote it that way, the condition absolute value of three one less than one is satisfied yeah so we'll start with y sub nine y sub nine simply means w nine plus three one w t nine minus one a three two w Nine minus two, seven, excuse me, three one squared, three one cubed, W six, three one raised four, W five, three one raised five, W six, three one raised six, Ws five. Three, seven, W two, three one, race eight, W one, three one, race nine, W zero. Looks painful. One of these, um, we, we won't go this far, I'll ask you to truncate somewhere. I'm just trying to make a point. Now, let's see, what is an easier way to evaluate this? If you have the like terms. Huh? If you like add the like terms together. Add the like terms. Okay, calculator is your friend, right? So we're going to use the calculator. So what we have here is W9, 3, 1, W8, 3, 1, squared, W7, and so forth. Cool. So all the time points are fair to list one. W is 1 over t plus 10, since the time values are in this 1, I can simply write list 2 as 1 divided by list 1 plus 10. Are you, um, do the 1 divided by list 1 at the end? Go up and simply start typing. One divided by look up. Did you go up to L2? Yeah. So one divided by second one list one plus ten. Okay. Good. We just have to figure out um, we will define uh, phi one. What is phi one? Point one. 
one. Let's pull and simply uh... Okay. I'm entering all the three values here at all point one. And you can see the power has increased from zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to five, nine. So I'm going to change less four, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good, but me so far. Uh, you see where I'm going with this. So what I'm simply doing is I'm taking I'm taking the time points for W. I'm putting all the time points in list one, and I took the expression for W and I put it in list two. And list three, I'm have I'm having all B1 values to be point one. Let's fall by putting the powers of P1. Now, all I have to do is define list five as list four raised uh, or point one raised to the power of L4. L4. Right. So you, so you can just do L3 raised to the power of L4. Yeah. And now that I think about it, we didn't even need L3, I could have simply did, you know, point one raised to the power of L4. It's okay. Um, so L3 raised to the power of L4. Good. Enter. Those are all the values that I have. Did we get this? Now, what should we do? We have to multiply the powers of V1 with Ws that we evaluated. The evaluated Ws are in list two. The evaluated Vs are in list five. So list six is simply list two. Times list five. With me, and so that's what I get. Good. Um, wait, I can get all six here. List two times list five. List two now has all the W values. List five has all the V1 base K values. I multiply them, I get um, L6. Now, how do we find the final answer? We just have to sum all them together. So I could simply do start over to count one last pass. List six, because that's going to give us some. So that sum happens to be 0 0.0588. Let's Are you switching the R down or? Um, not yet. Because this is useful for the homework. But I get that. I don't remember what. So for the next time, Y10. Oh, I mean, can you pull it back up on? So I should have written this down. But like, you should have. It's good. 
We really didn't go there. I just think the way that which is my theory. So we're starting at time 10. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Six, five, four, three, two, zero, for one, zero. We have to stop at zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. We can't go past zero. We don't have to change this because that expression does not change. That doesn't change. Well, you need an extra point one. Oh, you are correct. That should be one. But you never, you need to rerun the. Looks like it. I thought it would do it automatically, but it did. So L2 is the expression for WT. So one divided by list one plus 10. Then L3 you need another. So L3 we need another point. Okay, point one. L4, we need another, so which is 10. And we have to run this again. L5 was. L3, race L4. And L6 is simply L2 multiplied by L5. In other words, we are multiplying all the feed values with the doubling values. And those are the values that we have. Now we need to find the sum of list six. And we end up getting 0 0.055. It went down, but only by a tiny bit. Do we agree? And you also do the same thing for y, y11 or? Yeah, go ahead and let's do it for y11.7. By the way, so you don't need to reinsert it to everything. My mommy says so too. I know. We <laughs> know <laughs> this. Uh, Jet. So we are going to do the same process, but only this time, since it is Y11, we are going to start at W11 and go all the way up to um, zero. Instead of changing each one of them, I'm just going to go to the very end and put 11. Right. This is the Huh? It just fundamentally.
literally bothers me. But that's it. So it would it was like Wait, um, it just it, it just lost zero. Oh, it took out of zero. I think it's gonna be. It's just gonna mess everything up. It's fine. What we like is eleven, ten. This is why programming numbers are kind of bad. Not four. I don't write. Okay. So L2 is simply the expression that we have for W. So that would equal one divided by the time point second L1 plus 10. And so everything gets computed. Okay, so we need to add point one one more time. So point one. And here, that point one would correspond to V1 raised 11, right? because we're just going to keep on going. So 11. And that is L3 raise L4, enter. Lastly, it is simply L2, which contains all the value values that we evaluated. And we are going to multiply with the three powers that we evaluated, which is the net uh, by five. Enter. Now we just have to compute the sum of this six. There is just a sum function you're welcome to use that, but um, this is what we have. We get 0 0.053. Um, I have defined the values of t to be 1 over t plus 10, right? In practice, this is not the case. This is a deterministic mathematical expression. In practice, we would have that we t to be noise values, correct? So what we're going to have is noise that is normally distributed. And if we use that and fit the model, we're going to get a V1 value. And that V1 value is what's going to determine how the forecast is going to be. Does that make sense? So this would fall on the underlying principle when we get to the AR one more. Are we clear? So if you understand the difference equation part, you will easily understand the AR one more model part. Good. What is the AR one more? Nations chapter three. We'll get to that. So are we clear? Yeah. Yes. Now we're going to extend this to a second order difference equation. And second order difference equation would directly relate to an AR2. Does that make sense? So can I erase this? If the key items they know the condition for V1, the characteristic polynomial and how the values decrease as we go farther and farther. So when I get to AR1 model, it will make practical sense as to why things behave the way they do. Good.
second order difference equations. Um, let's see if you can tell me what this would look like. So we know y t equals um, phi one y t minus one plus w t. The w t is the noise component. And that's what we did earlier, and that is a first order difference equation. I want you to guess what the expression would be for a second order difference equation. Would it be y t equals v one? Y t minus two goes to v t minus two. Y t equals v would be v one or v two. You tell me. V two. V two. Y t minus two. Y t minus two plus w t minus two. W t minus one. I'm just having t t t uh, t t. Here are cases like tea coffee. It's bad for t t t. Okay, uh, do we agree with this or do we disagree with this? And I can see how it could be WT minus one. Okay, you're getting close. Well, why would that be? Well, because I mean, like, if you're subtracting by one for the other t. So you might as well do it for that one too. Right, so in that case, it's would be t minus one, t minus yeah. oh, Right? So try to leave with that. Okay, I want you to look at this from a very practical sense. So second order would mean whatever we do at time t is related to t minus one, t minus two. Yes. So what I said here, does that get anywhere closer to this? Do you want it to repeat that? So time t, time t is dependent on t minus one, t minus two. Whatever I said, mentioned here, does it agree with that equation? Why not, Alex? You're the one who gave me this. Well, I'm also the one who guessed as well. Okay, why did you say no? Because you're missing the t minus one. Exactly. So when I write it this way, so I'm at this point, and I'm just jumping over there. So still, it's a one step uh, jump, it's a one step time difference. Uh, that time point is dependent on this time point, this is also a first order difference equation, right? So this is not correct. A second order difference equation would be yt is equal to phi1 y t minus 1 plus phi2 y t minus 2 plus wt. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Did I get like half a bit? Yeah. And WSRT is our usual noise component. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this in terms of the lab operator. YT is V1. L y t. L times y t would it would mean it applies to lag one step to y t. P2 L squared y 17. Two labs apply to t, which would make it t minus two. No lag there, so it would just be w t. 
The other method to do this is recursive substitution. But imagine it was quite painful for us to do it for one step. Now we have two steps. So you have to go back and substitute two of them, simplify, substitute two of them, simplify, and it's going to take forever. And if we have to generalize it for a peak order difference equation. So the effective approach is to use lab equations. So if I move it to the other side, I have y take move those two to the other side, y t minus p one l, y t minus p two l squared, y t equals w sub t. Do we agree? Yes. And that would be one minus p one l minus p2 l squared multiplied by y3 equals nothing to say. What is the characteristic for the notion? What did we do to get the characteristic for the notion? So it's certainly to you know, perform these operations on an operator. So I'm going to look basically and write it as one minus p one z minus p two z squared. Good. And we will see this later on. I don't know what um, your book uses for the notation of this characteristic polynomial, but in practice. Uppercase B as a function of Z is the notation for the characteristic for the norm. In the previous case, uppercase B of Z was simply one minus P1 Z. Does that make sense? So keep this notation because when we switch over to moving average, I will use the notation uppercase. Theta. Does that make sense? Um, some people use psi or salvage with that psi or something else. So, how did we express yt in terms of wt? Well, we divided by 1 minus v1l, wrote it down the geometry series, um, and then things work out fine. But if I take this and divide it, I can't divide WT by that term, I'm not going to get a geometry series. Um, so how do we get to an expression for Y in terms of W if we have a second order difference equation? And clearly this is a quadratic function in Z, right? Quadratic equation set. So we did quadratic formula, we might get somewhere. So that makes sense. So good stop for introduction to second order difference equations. Um, 